Father, there is no one like you. You are the creator of the world and creator of man. All that we have belongs to you, and we offer it all back to you. Father, you know our trials, you know our cares. And today, Father, my heart is troubled, but I'm going to stand on the rock. I pray for my daughter, Asia. She was rushed to the hospital this morning as we were preparing for worship. So my wife is with her on her birthday. And you know my cousin, Frankly, Frankie, his last days are near. My heart is heavy, but I am in the house of the Lord with our people. So I ask my people, our people, my brothers and sisters, that you pray for me this morning. And that we know God's will will be done. We ask this in all things, in Jesus' name, amen. We are studying anthropology. And first, let me apologize. I wanted to do today, I wanted to do the survey, the spiritual gift survey. And I announced that last week. But again, because of logistics and just the continuation of the study of anthropology, we want to wait until anthropology is completed, and then we'll do the spiritual survey. So that would probably be the first week of February. OK? So we're going to continue on with our study of anthropology. Anthropology is the study of man. The origin of man was last week. Okay. And we talked about man, a tripartite being, body, soul, and spirit. Today we want to talk about the condition of man. Take off the grave cloth, saints. Next week we'll talk about the origin of sin, no temptation. And then we'll talk about the seriousness of sin, the nature of sin, and the provision. And then the last week of January, we'll have a review. And somehow we're going to have to figure out how I can be neutral and root for someone to defeat <laughs> Pastor Gaines and the Carolettes. Okay? And a personal thank you to Sister Cakes. The cake for Christmas was wonderful. The cake was wonderful. <laughs> and I didn't share. So <laughs> it's good to share, but I'm sorry. I was selfish. I don't even know if anyone in my family got a piece. So thank you, sister. I appreciate it. In, in the past, I talked about how Pastor Gaines and his early services always seems to steal from my notes. Last week, he had talked about the E's, exaltation, education, edification, equipping. And I was looking for the mission statement that morning. I couldn't find it, so we went over the Articles of Faith, very high level. But now I found it, and I'm going to go over it quickly, because we all should know the mission statement of the church. And I'm going to make this available. I just didn't, wasn't able to copy, make copies this morning. So the mission statement of Manor Bible Baptist Church. Our mission is to exalt and worship the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and God, and to educate, edify, and equip believers so that they become fully devoted followers of Christ, who are empowered to effectively evangelize the lost and engage the community. We should have that in our heart. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to pass this out next week, and every week we're going to recite it, okay, until we, until we remember it in our hearts. Okay. Let us do a quick review. So, of course, I'm going to need three folks to help me pass out the documents for each side, or two from this side. And all I ask is that you, before you start looking them over, if you can just, if I can just get your attention. Okay. Actually, I flipped them around. Can I get someone for the middle? Actually, turn them around, but they go this way. Yeah, I like that. Oh, Sheila. Sheila? Okay. Can someone do the back so we can get going? Okay. And I'll hang on to a few in case folks come in a little later. And I have about five copies from last week. But after, we'll, we'll go through the afterwards, okay? I'll, we'll do it later. We'll do it afterwards.
While they're distributing that, I'm going to just go ahead and get started. We're not going to go from the handbook, handouts yet. But remember the great prophet Elijah? Remember after, even after his great victory against Jezebel, Ahab, and their gods? You need more? And remember after that great victory, he became discouraged? Well, that is typical, or not typical, but after a great victory, Satan always comes to discourage the believers. And we are, we are still human, and we still have human nature. Even though as believers we have the nature of Christ, the nature of Christ did not replace the Adamic nature. So we still must contend with the Adamic nature. So today we're going to talk about five areas in the life of man believers and non-believers that we must contend with. And those five areas are lying, anger, stealing, corrupt speech, and bitterness. But let me preface that with this. Let us quickly talk about temptation and sin. The soul houses our intellect, emotion, and will. And as the soul controls our salvation, Sin begins in the soul and ends in death. For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Sin is rebellion against God. Temptation is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. We think of sin as a single act, but God sees sin as a process. Sin is a four-stage process. We be sin begins with desire, leads to deception, and deception leads to disobedience, and disobedience leads to death. Let's talk about desire. Desire impacts our emotions. The normal desires of life were given to us by God and of themselves are not sinful. Desires are normal. However, when we want to satisfy these desires out of the will of God, they can lead to sin. For example, sister, you shouldn't have gave me that cake. Eating is normal. Gluttony is sin. And I'm not, and what did Forrest Gump say? And that's all I got to say about that. Okay, we all are sinful. Now, we're not going to stop pointing our individual sins, but gluttony is sin. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Sleeping is normal, but laziness is sin. Marital sex, uh-oh, can't talk about sex in church. Marital sex is normal, but adultery is sin. We must be in constant control of our desires. Our desires must be, be our servants and not our masters. Our desires must be our servants and not our masters. Sin begins in the soul. Our emotions cannot be controlled by our desires. Sin houses intellect, emotions, and will. Deception. Desire grows to deception. Deception impacts our intellect. Temptation always appears more alluring than it really is, and it carries bait that appeals to our natural desires. The bait not only attracts us, but also hides the fact that yielding to the desire will eventually bring sorrow and punishment. When faced with temptation, we must get our eyes off of the bait and look ahead and see the consequences of sin, the judgment of God. For example, in the study of pneumatology, we talked about David and Bathsheba and the consequences of his sin. When David looked upon Uriah's wife, he never would have committed adultery if he had seen the tragic consequences. The death of a baby, Bathsheba's son, the murder of his brave soldier, Uriah, and the violation of his daughter, Tamar. The bait keeps us from seeing the deception and consequences of sin. 
Sin begins in the soul. Our intellect must not be deceived, for the soul houses our intellect, emotions, and will. Disobedience. Disobedience impacts our will. Desire conceives a method for taking the bait of deception. The will approves and acts, and the result is sin. Christian living is a matter of will and not feelings and emotions. Let me say that again. Christian living is a matter of the will and not feelings and emotions. Children act on the basis of feelings and emotions. Adults act on the basis of the will. For example, mature Christians act because it is right, regardless of how they feel emotionally. Immature Christians refuse to act decisively and easily fall prey to emotions and temptation. Disobedience gives birth to death, not life. And though it may take some time for sin to mature, when it does, the result is death. Sin is a process that begins in the soul and ends in death. Death. Death impacts our relationship, our spirit, our commune with God. Sin is planted with the seed of desire, nourished and fertilized with deception that grows the sin into the act of disobedience that ends and withers in death, spiritual death, physical death, or eternal death, and sometimes all three, spiritual, physical, and eternal death. The example in the garden, Eve and the serpent. Desire, deception, disobedience, and death. The serpent used desire to interest Eve. Eve saw that the tree was good for food, Genesis 3 and 6, and her desire was aroused. Deception. The serpent deceived Eve. The bait he used with Eve was the fact that the forbidden tree was good and pleasant and that eating of it would make her wise. Eve saw that the bait saw the bait but forgot the Lord's warning, the Lord's warning. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2 and 17. No, God did not say if you eat of the fruit. But he said in the day. God sees the pet present, the past, present and future at the same time. And even in Eve's sin, he made the provision for salvation. Disobedience. Eve disobeyed God by taking the fruit of the tree and eating it. Death. Both Adam and Eve experienced immediate spiritual death, separation from God. Note Adam and Eve was hiding. And ultimately, they suffered physical death. The body started to deteriorate. Remember, man was created as an immortal being to live forever. But once they were disobedient, death entered mankind. And they immediately started to follow, start to incur physical death. The body deteriorated. All men die because of Adam. But we are without excuse. Sin is personal. We cannot blame our sin, blame our sin on anyone else. Sin is personal. Amen? Let's take out the handouts. First page looks like this. Remember, information without application is just information. If we're not going to apply the word, it's just information. And we have so much information in our head, it gets cluttered. So application. Man is a tripartite being. Now, God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the devil is a liar. He's a counterfeit. He also has, has his trinity. He has Satan, the false witness, the false witness, Satan, and the Antichrist. And man is a tripartite being consisting of body, soul, and spirit. The body is unconscious. 
It is our physical or material existence. The soul is physical, is physical consciousness, immaterial, and the spirit is God consciousness. And it is also immaterial. It is not physical. Now, we wanted to attack three questions. The first question was, does man's spirit differ from his soul? And the answer is yes. The spirit and soul are different. Second question, is man's soul and or spirit eternal? Is the soul eternal? Yes. Is the spirit eternal? Yes. Remember we said that the body, physical existence, came from the dust of the earth. And when the body dies, it returns to the earth, dust to dust. But the soul and the spirit, spirit are immaterial, and they return to God that created them. Next part of the question, does the soul and spirit's eternality depend on salvation? The answer is no. The spirit and the soul are eternal. Salvation determines where they spend eternity. We clear? Okay. The third question, do animals have souls? Now, prior to last week, if I was to ask you that question, how many would have said no? Be honest. Probably would have said no. Right. Now, based on the definition of the handbook, it says what? The soul is physical consciousness. Animals have physical consciousness. But we have to be careful when we answer the question because if, you, if someone asks you, does animals have soul, and you say yes and leave it at that, they're going to equate that to the soul of the animal and the soul of man are the same. But we understand now that the soul of animals and the soul of man are different. When the animal dies, the soul dies with the body and returns to the dust. The soul of the animal was not given by breath by God, only man. Does the soul of animals differ from the soul of man? Yes. Okay? We talked about Uncle Ben. The spirits last week a different kind of spirits. Out of, the mouth, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Matthew 12 and 34. The soul controls the will. The will controls the mind. The mind controls the body. The body controls the heart. The heart controls the tongue. And through the tongue, we confess our salvation. Remember, when the body was created by God, it was not alive. Only until he breathed his spirit was the body quickened and became a living being. So the body, in regards to sin, is neutral. What do you feed the body? That will determine if it's a body of sin or it is a body of Christ. Does it, do you answer to the things of the world or to the things of heaven. The, the soul controls our salvation. And when I say the soul controls our salvation, I mean our human responsibility. To accept the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to do that. We have to make that responsibility. Okay? And it is within our soul. The spirit communes with God. But the soul is the innermost part of the man. Intellect, emotion, and will. God and man, going down that first page, the soul, when we speak of the image of God, we speak of intellect, emotion, and will, we're talking about the soul. And when we talk about being made in God's likeness, we're talking about morality, and it is in the spirit. The world, when we speak of the world, there's three definitions. The earth and the planet, mankind, and the world system. And the world system is an enemy of God. Now, remember we had this statement before we talked about God the Father gave God the Son and so on and so on. If you really think about that statement, it is a profound statement because it, a high, it is a high-level statement that if you fill in the blanks, it will give you the history of man. Also, it will define the history or the relationship between sinful man and holy God. And also, it is the plan of salvation. But there's some blanks you must fill in, but think about it. 
Why did God the Father give God the Son? There's a reason. Something happened. It happened back in the garden. And then God the Son gave man God the Holy Spirit. Why? Something happened. And then God the Holy Spirit convicts man and brings man back to God the Son. And then God the Son brings man back to God the Father. If you think about the statement and you fill in a few blanks, you have the plan of salvation. You have the relationship between man and God. Okay? And that's what we're here to study, anthropology. The study of man. Why do we do what we do? God's creation. The world, mankind, and the, crea and the Christian. The unsaved man is spiritually ignorant. You cannot make that, sat that statement to an unsaved person and expect them to understand it. You cannot make that statement to a person of the cult and expect them to understand it. The unsaved man is spiritually ignorant, whereas the Christian is intelligent in the things of the word. The unsaved man does not know Christ, whereas the believer grows in his personal knowledge of Christ day by day. We have believed the truth we have received the life, therefore we walk in the way, and we do not walk after the example of the unsaved world. We are a separated people, a called out people. We are different. We are odd. We are odd with a purpose. We are odd by God. God has made us odd for his purposes. So if everyone in the world loves you, something's wrong. Something is wrong. The old man has been put away, and we can now walk in the newness of life through Christ. We, will, we belong to God's new creation in Christ. Therefore, the ideas and desires of the old creation no longer should control our lives. That's 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Saints, it is time to remove the world's grave cloths. Lying, stealing, corrupt speech, anger, and bitterness. Now, of course, this is not for you all. No one in here tells lies. And when I mean tell a lie, I'm talking about habitual liars. No one in here has ever stole anything in their life. And we, everything we say out of our mouth is godly. And I'll be honest, that's the one I struggle with probably the most. Coarse joking or some things I should not say out of my mouth. Corrupt speech. We all have our weaknesses, right? Gluttony. We all have our sins, right? And we all have to deal with them. If we are honest, if we want to grow day by day, we must be honest. What about anger? Anyone here deals with anger? Yeah, yeah. Our poor pastor always talk about the beltway, beltway, what's that, road range? Road range. <laughs> but I just can't see him getting but so mad. I just, just can't see it. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us would say something a little harsher. <laughs> and what about bitterness? Bitterness, when you talk about anger and you let it simmer and you never get rid of it, you can become bitter. Okay? And what did Christ say about anger? Anger is the beginning of murder. So we must be careful with our anger. Let's turn to the next page. Now, say take off the grave cloth. How? How are we going to take off the grave cloths? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Ephesians 4 and 23. Can you all hear me clearly in the back? We okay? Okay. As he thinketh in his heart, so he doeth. Proverbs 23, 7. When we say sin begins in the soul, it's in the mind. We have to control our thoughts. You do not want to become preconditioned to sin. And what do I mean by that? You ever see someone that witnessed someone, be, someone else being victimized? Or like say a bully beat up someone, right? And, and a stander by didn't help the victim, but got a lot to say about it. If that was me, oh, you wouldn't have did that to me. What I would do in all this, all this talk, what I would do, what you have done is preconditioned yourself to sin. What you have said, if I come into a circumstance, this is how I'm going to respond. This is how I'm going to react. 
and, you, and it may not call for that reaction. So do not precondition yourself to sin. Don't predetermine what you would do unless it's godly, okay? The word of God renews the mind as we surrender our all to him. Sanctify them through, through thy truth. The word is the truth, and as the man understands the truth of God's word, I'm in the blue block, it is gradually transformed by the spirit, green block. And this renewal leads to a change of life. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let's talk about the first one, lying, a lie. A lie is a statement that is contrary to fact, spoken with the intent to deceive, intent. Satan is a liar. John 8, 44. Have you ever, I guess it would be those new age churches where they do a lot of dancing and shouting and talking and say, dance on the head of the devil and all that stuff. I don't want no parts of that. <laughs> I want to be as far from Satan as possible can be. We need to understand his power. And you talking about dancing on his head? Question, are you crazy? When we speak the truth, the Spirit of God works. However, whenever we speak a lie, Satan goes to work. And let's talk about a little white lie. A little white lie is, in fact, a lie. A little white lie is just a lie waiting for the color of darkness. It's just waiting for the darkness of black or gray to be colored in. It never can, be, can remain white because it is a lie. We do not walk in the realm of the shadows. Be truthful. We may believe that we can help one another by speaking lies or little white lies, but the sad consequences will come. Perhaps not immediately, but they will come. You know that no lie is of the truth. 1 John 2 and 21. Satan is a liar, and he wants us to believe that God is a liar. Genesis 3 and 1. Yea, yeah. Has God said, he's questioning God's word. Did he really say, is that what he meant? Satan is very cunning, very crafty. Christians, be careful. Lying. It said that hell is prepared for whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Those whose lives are controlled by lies and love and make lies are lost forever. The Christian's life is controlled by the truth. We are to build the body, the church, in love and build the body in truth, speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4 and 15. As members of one another, we affect each other. We cannot build each other up apart from the truth. Practical application. Anybody here ever fall asleep in church? Yes? Okay, a lot of hands went up. <laughs> that might be a problem, but. <laughs> yes? Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Pastor, you okay? He just walked out. He just walked by. He said, uh, go ahead, sir. Hey, I said I, I felt uh, one, three, ten, eleven miles that previous night. Still come. That's another issue. Man. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, okay. All right. Well, I'm not going to give a definition of excuses. But it sounds something like twos are the weak and incompetent and something, you know. But that was a fraternity thing. But anyway, so we, admittedly, we fall asleep in church, right? Now, the point is, if you fall asleep in church and somebody asks you, just admit it. Do not tell a little white lie by denying the truth. It's obvious you fell asleep. You don't have to tell us because we saw you sleeping. <laughs> it is what it is. You were snoring. <laughs> and not only were you snoring, 
you were drooling. We have evidence. So if they ask you, were you sleeping? Oh, oh no. Tell the truth. And I'm going to tell you why. You can die from falling asleep in church. Did you know that? And here we go, Tony, making up some stuff, right? Okay. Did you hear the story about Eutychus and Peter? You heard that story before in Acts 20 and 9? Well, I don't think we have time because I got about three or four more pages to get through, but I'm just going to give you briefly what happened. Eutychus was a young man. And I guess he was like you, some, was out working, he was hard working. But if you're tired and sleepy, why would you sit on the windowsill? <laughs> he sat on the windowsill. Yeah. Peter was preaching, and Peter went on and on and on. But the word was good, so Peter preached all night long. And then all of a sudden, you heard a thump. Yeah. Eutychus fell out the window and fell dead. <laughs> now, as we said in the study of pneumatology, the healing gifts have passed away. So if you fall asleep, bump your head on the pew and fall dead, <laughs> Pastor David Gaines is not going to be able to resurrect you. <laughs> now, if you was in Peter's time, Peter went and said, excuse me, walked out to church and went and said, get up, boy, and raised him from the dead. But that gift has passed away. So if you fall asleep, don't tell the little white lie. Just say, yeah, I fell asleep, and thank God I didn't bump my head. <laughs> Let's start with the next page. Take off the grave cloth, grave cloth, anger. Anger is an emotional arousal caused by something that displeases us. It doesn't say that it's right or wrong. It just says it displeases us. We could be wrong. But anger is an emotional arousal. In itself, anger is not sin. God can be angry. Holy anger of God is a part of his judgment against sin. And we should be angry, angry about sin. Yes. The vote they had a few months ago, we should have been angry about that. Anger can be kindled. Anger is compared to fire, Genesis 30 and 2. Malice, now we're talking about the progression of anger. Malice is anger we allow to smolder. That means we get angry and we don't resolve it. And it smolders. When this anger bursts forth into destruction, it becomes wrath. You don't want to come up against the wrath of a Christian. Our anger is not holy anger. Usually, it is sin. It is possible to be angry and not sin. But if we do sin, we must settle the matter quickly. Agree with thine adversary quickly. That's Matthew 5 and 25. Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Key phrase, him alone. Don't get on the phone. If you're going to get on the phone, speak the gospel and not gossip. And don't think if I just tell that one person, it's going to be between the three of us now. Well, it multiplies. The fire of anger, if not quenched by the loving oil of forgiveness. Let me read that again. The fire of anger if not quenched by the loving oil of forgiveness, will spread and defile and destroy the work of God. Now you say oil, but if you put oil on fire, doesn't it make the fire grow bi bigger? But we're talking about a supernatural oil, the oil of forgiveness made in love. Jesus said, anger is the first step towards murder. Matthew chapter 5. Anger gives Satan a foothold into our lives. Satan hates God and hates God's people. That's not a secret. It should not be a secret to us. Not only does Satan hate God, but he hates God's people, God's representatives. When he finds a believer with sparks of anger in his heart, he fans the sparks, adds fuel to the fire, and does great damage to God's people and God's church. Both lying and anger give peace to the devil. Peace. That's a different kind of peace. To be angry with the Aristotle. Aristotle, he tells us how difficult it is to be angry and not sin. He says, to be angry with the right person to the right degree at the right time for the right purpose and in the right way is not easy. 
the word of God, Solomon says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. It also has been said that anger is momentary insanity. Think about when you see a really angry person. They have lost their mind. They are out of their mind. There's something wrong. Next page. Stealing. Take off the grave cloth. Stealing. Thou shall not steal is one of the Ten Commandments. And when God gave the commandment, he instituted the right of private property and ownership. So if it belongs to you, another man cannot come and take it. Just as Satan is a liar and a murderer, he is also a thief. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's John 10 and 10. Satan turned Judas into a thief, and he would do the same to us. When Satan tempted Eve, he led her to become a thief, for she took the fruit which, which was forbidden. Satan is a thief, John 8 and 44. Eve, in turn, made Adam a thief. He also partook of the tree of the fruit which did not belong to him. If one murders, he is a thief. How? For he steals the life of another. And not only does he steal the life of the person, he steals everything that that person could have become. If one worship idols, he is a thief, for he steals or denies God his glory. If one is an adulteress, he is a thief, for he steals the honor of the marriage covenant. If one bears false witness, he is a thief, for he steals or hides the truth. If one is covetous, he is a thief, for it's not a matter of if he will steal from his neighbor, but a matter of when he will steal from his neighbor. If one is lazy, he is a thief, for he steals the value of God's spiritual gifts. If you're sitting on your spiritual gifts, you are a thief. Sorry. The first Adam was a thief and was cast out of paradise. The last Adam, Christ, turned to a thief and said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. If a man would not work, neither shall he eat. A lazy Christian with the ability to work and or serve robs himself, other Christians, and God. When called by God, many men of the Bible or the scriptures were busy at work. For example, when God called Moses, Moses was caring for sheep. He was busy at work. Gideon was threshing wheat. David was minding his father's flock. And the first four disciples were either casting nets, fishermen, or mending the nets. Jesus himself was a carpenter. Now, if anyone could have taken it easy, you'd think it would have been Jesus. But he worked, and he worked with his hands and his mind, the work of carpentry. Um, the next page. Corrupt speech? Is that where we are? Take off the grave cloths. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Corrupt speech. That which is worthless, bad, or rotten. God expects a change in our speech when we become a Christian. Christ makes a difference in a man's speech. When you are saved, when you become a Christian, when you mature, when you grow in grace, your speech should change. The sinner's mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, Romans 3 and 14. But when he trusts Jesus, when he trusts Christ, he gladly confesses with his mouth, Jesus is Lord. Remember, the body is neutral. That same mouth that curses can also profess Jesus is Lord. It's controlled by the soul. As a condemned sinner, his mouth is stopped before the throne of God. But as a believer, his mouth is open to praise God. Change the heart, and you change the speech. The Apostle Paul, as an unsaved rabbi, 
he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. But when he trusted Christ, a change took place. Behold, he prayeth. Paul went from praying like an animal, hunting, praying on Christians, to praying with and for Christians. Our words do not have to be dirty to be useless. It does not have to be a cussing word. The Apostle Peter, cock a doo doo Then Peter began to swear and curse, I know not the man. The appetites of the old life sometimes show up and we permit filthy communication out of the mouth. Colossians 3 and 8. Their throat is an open sepulchre. Romans 3 and 13. What is a sepulchre? I can't pronounce that word. I've always tried to and I never could. Sepulchre. What is it? It is a burial vault or tomb. Mouth is a grave site. What is the remedy? Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Colossians 4 and 6. Fill your heart with the love of Christ so that only truth and purity can come out of the mouth. The consequences of corrupt speech can be deadly. Everybody know the story in 2 Kings 2, 23 and 24? Again, because of time, I won't go into the entire story, but I'll give you an overview. Remember a few weeks back when I talk about when I give the handouts and everybody starts to look down and I see all these different hairs, shades of gray, shades of black, long hair, short hair, bald heads. And uh, the pastor was here, his brother was here. And we know they're lacking in hair. But let me tell you this. Be careful when you talk about the man of God. Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, was walking along. And I believe it was like 42 kids. And they said, hey, bald head. <laughs> Mistake. What did Elisha do? He sent the bear. The man with the bare head sent the bear and killed the 42 kids. Now, I read that. I said, boy, that was harsh, Elisha. I mean, just because they said, put on a toupee or something. But anyway, we got to be careful with our words, okay? Now, I didn't call anybody bald head. Let's make sure we understand that, okay? I just said how we see certain heads. Take off the grave cloths. Next page, bitterness. And this is especially dangerous because the person can look well from the outside, but on the inside, they're bitter, cold-hearted, and dead. Bitterness refers to a settled hostility that poisons the whole inner man. And when we talk about settled hostility, we don't mean that the issue has been settled. We mean that the anger has settled inside the man. The anger has settled and taken hold and taking up residency. Someone does something we do not like, so we harbor ill will against them. Bitterness leads to wrath, which is an explosion on the outside of the feelings on the inside. It's like walking around with dynamite, and it's just a matter of time before it explodes. Wrath, wrath and anger only leads to brawling, clamor, and blasphemy, evil talk the fights. Brawling, the first leads to fighting with fists, the tongue. The latter leads to fighting with words. Both are deadly. Reasons to avoid bitterness. We always talk about grieving the Holy Spirit, but we also can grieve the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Reasons to avoid bitterness, it grieves the Holy Spirit, Son of God, and God the Father. The Spirit lives within Christians, and when the heart is filled with bitterness and anger, the Spirit grieves. The Holy Spirit is happiest in an atmosphere of love, joy, and peace. Those fruits of the Spirit that are God were. If you go back to your old handout, you will see that those are the three spirits of the fruit that point to God. Bitterness robs us of joy, the joy of our salvation, and the fullness of the Spirit's blessing. I did not say it, 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 it robs us of salvation. No, it robs us of joy of our salvation. The Son. 
Bitterness and anger grieves God the Son, who died for our sins. Jesus teaches us to love one another. Jesus lived a life of love to demonstrate and model the way to overcome the manward sins in our trials of life. Jesus is the ultimate forgiver of sins. Personal forgiver of sins. The Father. God the Father forgave our sins when we, when we put our trust in Christ. The wrath of the Father against God the Son on Calvary's cross was not a wrath of anger and bitterness, but a holy wrath of hatred towards sin. His wrath was a holy wrath. And his anger was not against Jesus, but the sin of mankind, the sin of the world. Anger and bitterness is sin, and sin is a rebellious attitude towards God. Bitterness. The basic cause of bitterness, a bitter attitude, is because we cannot forgive people. We must be forgiven. The, an unforgiving spirit is the devil's playground. And before long, it becomes the Christian's battleground. We will deal with it, and it will not be favorable. Bitterness hardens the heart, and we should be tender-hearted and kind. Instead, we become hard-hearted and bitter. Bitterness in the heart makes us treat others the way Satan treats them. Let me say that again. Bitterness in the heart makes us treat others the way Satan treats them, whereas we should treat others the way God has treated us. Amen? Amen. Learning how to forgive and forget is one of the secrets of a happy Christian life. Loose him, take off the grave cross, and let him go. How? If we YTO, we can WWW. If we yield to the Spirit, trust the Spirit, obey the Spirit, we can walk in the Spirit, witness in the Spirit, and worship in the Spirit. Amen?